before 2011, there were there were a series of, I mean, there were the the events of the Arab Spring happening elsewhere. Uh, people understood it to be spontaneous all over the place, starting in Tunisia. But of course, there were there were civil society groups and there were there were uh, opposition politicians and activists, in in each of the countries, including Syria, that that eventually sort of uh, had these these movements against uh, against dictatorial rule. So in Syria, there were there was a whole a, a, a number of activists, many of whom were quite old and had been in opposition for decades. Uh, to uh, the Assad government and to the Ba'athist government. Uh, so these people were around, a lot of communists, uh, Arab socialists, uh, oppositional uh, Arab nationalists, and, and people like that. Um, some Islamists, but they, of course, membership in the Muslim Brotherhood was a crime punishable by death after the insurgency in 1982. So those people were, were not not as overt as, uh, as the secular activists. Uh, younger activists probably centered around the arts, uh, music, uh, uh, academic, uh, and, but many of those people had by necessity left the country. So some of these people who were outside the country, I mean, there were a lot of, I, I spoke with a number of young people who were outside the country and they said, well, if something doesn't happen in Syria, you know, shame on us. Because if the Tunisians can do it, and the, and the Egyptians can do it, and the Libyans can do it, and the Yemenis can do it, heaven help the Syrians if they can't do something to, to, uh, to, to, to change their own condition and, and assert the rights of citizenship. Uh, and so this was sort of the, the mood uh, in February and March of, of, uh, of 2010. And so there were a series of, of protests that started. And at the beginning, the government was quite considered and, and, uh, and clever, actually, in, in, uh, in clamping down on these protests. And in some cases, there were, you know, there were indications that the government was going to uh, take people's grievances seriously. And then there was this, this, this uh, uh, a bunch of kids in Dara, in the south on the Jordanian border. Uh, these kids painted on the, on the walls of their school, the people demand uh, the fall of the regime. And, and reportedly they also said, your turn, doctor, meaning Bashar al-Assad. And the government responded, probably local officials in the first instance, uh, by arresting these, these kids, about 15 kids, and torturing them. And, and telling their parents when their parents went to go find out what was going on with them that they were, you know, get out of here, we have them and we're going to keep them and, and you're out of luck. Big protests took place in Dara uh, of by first the, the, the extended families of these, of these boys who were from prominent, not prosperous, but prominent families locally. Uh, and then the government responded to these with live fire. And this was really the beginning. And, and the government immediately began to brand the people who were protesting as Islamists and criminals and foreign-inspired terrorists. And after a week or so, they stormed a mosque in the center of Dara. They stormed it uh, and killed a bunch of people in the mosque, which had sort of served as a, as a protest, uh, uh, kind of a, a protest headquarters in a way. They stormed it and, and claimed and filmed on state TV a bunch of weapons, which were probably almost certainly planted uh, and, and put there to bolster, to support the government's case that it was fighting an armed insurgency. The government had no rhetorical political weapons either to back out of the, the, the introduction of violence, on the one hand, uh, because prosecuting its own officials would have sort of opened it up to all kinds of other uh, places that it wasn't prepared or, or capable of going in the first place. And secondly, the, the government wasn't equipped, didn't have the, wasn't set up 
as a kind of a, a an authoritarian state to respond to, to citizen grievances. And so the opposition had to be defined as illegitimate in order to, to make the case that the state itself maintained its legitimacy. But this didn't work. And, and by resorting to violence and, and by uh, branding all citizen protests and all grievances uh, illegitimate, uh, foreign-inspired, treasonous, uh, sectarian, based on a religious fanaticism of, of, uh, of, of Islamic uh, criminals. It, it made every death uh, seem as if it, it was, uh, the state itself was committing crimes, and, and thereby undermine the legitimacy of the state itself in the minds of first a few and then many more uh, citizens, I think. And this is really how, how things began. It's very hard to say when the opposition became uh, militarized, but it's, it seems certain to me that the claims of the government that the opposition was militarized were fallacious for a period of months. Uh, I mean, I, I, had, I was in uh, Lebanon about a month after the first protests in, in, uh, in, in Syria. And I had conversations with people who were broadly supportive of the government, or at least worried about what would happen if the government really uh, lost its legitimacy wholesale. And these conversations always came along the lines of, well, there are go there's, there's armed elements. But no one could ever tell you who the armed elements were or how they got any weapons. And it was the case uh, that Iraq was awash in weapons because of the 2003 war. And Lebanon had been awash in weapons because of the, the civil war, 17 years of civil war. But in Syria, ordinary citizens didn't have weapons. If they had weapons, they were quite old. Uh, and uh, I had a conversation with a friend of mine who said, well, there's, there's, there's armed gangs all over the place. And I asked him, well, are, do you mean the, the, the government? And he said, armed gangs, which was the precise formulation that the government was using on state TV and so on. Are they government gangs? Armed gangs. Are they aligned with the government? Armed gangs. Are you saying the protesters are armed? Armed gangs. So who are they? Armed gangs. This was the, the, this was the, the, uh, the claim. Uh, it was the case at this time that a Kalashnikov in Syria cost $2,000 uh, with no bullets. Now, $2,000 is about two years' salary uh, for the average sort of ordinary uh, job in Syria. So it's the equivalent of a, of, a, of a weapon to challenge the state here, say, you know, costing what? Almost as much as a house. Uh, so a $2,000 Kalashnikov was beyond the capabilities of practically anybody, uh, except for very wealthy people. So it was also the case that, that the government, that people in the army were selling them, stealing them and selling them, probably, and things like that. But the, the notion that the opposition was armed from an early stage, I think, is, is, is actually, it's, it's, it was state propaganda. Uh, without any basis in reality. And it also seemed to be the case that as these protests would take place, elements would shoot, but no one really knew who was shooting. And it was the case that eventually uh, armed elements emerged, but it took months and months. And in a way, it was, it was the, the opposition that the, that the government itself wished to conjure because this was an opposition which could be dealt with legitimately with mass uh, violence, unlike, unlike, unlike unarmed citizens making, making claims against the state. Syria has two principal uh, uh, foreign allies, and these are allies of long, I mean we're talking about decades and decades here. 
uh, locally is Iran, which was an ally uh, since the revolution uh, in 1979. And the Iran-Iraq war between the, the Iraqi government and the Iranian, the revolutionary Iranian government uh, from 1980 to 1988. It is not a sectarian alliance. Uh, and the idea that somehow that the, the nominal uh, historical Shiism of the Syrian ruling establishment is, leads to some sort of religious sympathy with the Iranians. This is complete nonsense. It, it, such arguments are, are misunderstandings and they, 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 they uh, underestimate the, po the political interests of these, of these countries, these countries the, the, you know, the, the clearly identified political interests from their perspective. And then, of course, from the Syrian, uh, the Syrian other Syrian ally of long standing is uh, Russia and the Soviet Union before Russia. And this goes back to the 1960s uh, and, and, uh, and even before. And so this is also a long standing alliance uh, of decades and decades uh, based on, on common interests and, and, uh, and trust and, and, uh, and, and um, common and, you know, and a long past. So these are not casual things from which one country or another is going to be, it's going to be casually uh, dismissed by a speech from uh, Hillary Clinton at the UN. Uh, these are real historical alliances of, of long standing, which are durable and serious. And, and, uh, and, the, and all of these countries, uh, uh, Iran, and especially Russia, identify uh, Bashar al-Assad as their client in the Middle East, and a person who is a, a, a kind of a, a representation of their own power and prestige. And I think that the Russians, and to a lesser degree the Iranians, will, they will support uh, Bashar al-Assad till there are no more Syrians left. For very complicated reasons, uh, the, the Saudi government is a major Force. And I think probably the principal uh, destabilizing force, uh, I mean, this, the principal uh, opposition force or opposition uh, sponsor, we can say, in favor of violence in Syria uh, at the moment. Of course, they don't have a, the, the Saudis don't have a land border with, uh, with Syria. And the notion that they are getting weapons to Syria, I think, has always been a little, it seemed, I was a bit incredulous about this, and I remain a bit incredulous about this. Of course, the Saudis have, have boatloads of money, uh, and also a structure within Lebanon uh, of, of the, 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 the Lebanese political establishment uh, that is interested in and closely linked with, uh, with the Saudi ruling establishment. So, the, uh, probably what is happening is that the Saudis are providing money and the, the Lebanese are providing weapons over the border uh, into Syria to, to, to support various elements that they, that they can identify who will take their money and their weapons. Qatar, of course, is, uh, has been critical uh, of, the, of the Syrian government. Now, it's interesting because both of these countries, of course, are monarch monarchies. Uh, and in a way, they have been sectarian in their in their opposition to the Syrian government. Uh, so they are, uh, seem to be, I mean, to the extent that there's an Islamist opposition, it's, it's sponsored by uh, these countries. There's Turkey, uh, Jordan, these are the, the neighboring countries, uh, Iraq, uh, and all of them are now host to hundreds of thousands uh, or tens of thousands of, of Syrian refugees in any case. And in some cases, probably mostly in Turkey, uh, because of the, 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 the geography, um, armed groups, uh, armed opposition groups are moving back and forth across the border there uh, in the area around Aleppo and north of, of, uh, of the town of Latakia and so on. Um, which is also complicated in Turkey because the, the, the Alawi minority, uh, which is overrepresented in the Syrian ruling structure and has become 
uh, the Syrian ruling structure has become more sectarian in its, in its rhetorical uh, uh, structure, in its rhetorical arguments, uh, this minority is well represented in Turkey, particularly in that area. So there's all kinds of tensions, and, and the, the Turkish uh, Alawi in this area, who are Arabic speakers in many cases, are, are, are uh, uh, supporters of the Syrian government. So it's, and the Turkish government, you see that it becomes frightfully complicated uh, on many levels. So, I mean, Syrian citizens uh, have plenty of reasons to oppose the government. Uh, they don't need the help of foreigners to do it. Uh, and they don't need foreign inspiration to be opposed to the government uh, either, just as Iraqis didn't need foreign inspiration, guidance, leadership, or anything else to oppose the American occupation of their country. The Syrian government is not in control of its, of its repressive apparatus. And the opposition, especially the, the original opposition, the secular political opposition, is not in control of its movement. Uh, and that's not to say that anyone's in control, really. But the, the introduction of those, of those, of those uh, uh, well-funded and, and deeply engaged outside forces, uh, the Saudis, the Qataris, the Turks, uh, the Americans, uh, the Iranians, the Russians, uh, make the likelihood that any of those group, that those two, the, either the central state or the opposition, will be able to assert some sort of unified position, it makes it less likely. So. Now, uh, as far as the United States is concerned, the U.S. policy or U.S., if there's anything going on, it's very low key. And, and, and uh, unusually uh, secret, because usually these things don't remain secret very long. Uh, if they're successful, you know, these people start boasting about them. And if they're unsuccessful, their political, domestic political rivals leak them uh, right away. So, I mean, secrecy in the United States in foreign affairs, as far as I can tell, particularly with regard to the, to the Middle East, is basically, seems mostly uh, uh, preoccupied with protecting one's one's professional reputation and covering, you know, what, what they say. Uh, I won't use the colorful expression, but, but uh, everyone knows what it is. Um, so we haven't heard much, and I think that's probably because there's not much going on. Uh, and to the extent that there is anything going on, it's going, it's going through Turkey probably, uh, U.S. Uh, uh, operations in, in Syria, providing some sort of supposedly communications uh, materials to Syrian factions, oppositional factions. Uh, there are certainly weapons coming in. The opposition is far better armed than they were originally. But a lot of this stuff may be coming from the Syrian army. People are defecting with their weapons. Um, so I think the United States is not doing very much, and I think that's as it should be. Um, I mean, since the beginning of the, of the uprising, uh, there have been kinds of uh, admissions on the part of the Syrian government that, that the Syrian government is serving the interests of Israel. And there have been admissions on the part of the Israeli ruling structure and military that the Syrian government, as presently configured, is serving Israeli interests. Both of these admissions are breathtaking uh, because the Syrians, the Syrian government has based its legitimacy for 40 years and longer, in fact, uh, even before Hafez al-Assad, on its being part of the, the so-called resistance front, the, the states that, it, that refused to accept uh, the Israeli writ uh, in the region. Now, we've seen that this is pure baloney. The, the Syrian government is sending at the earliest stage, sending a, le a, a message to, the, to Israel and to the United States that we provide a stable status quo and you have to support us. And this resonates. And the Israelis have heard this. And so it's quite surreal and bizarre to behold, but the Israeli security establishment have discovered that they love Bashar al-Assad. That Bashar al-Assad is actually the best uh, uh, Middle Eastern dictator. People also discovered that they loved Hosni Mubarak, uh, 
shortly before he fell. Uh, but this is really quite a, and so the idea that the Israelis are anything but um, uh, worried about the post, uh, post-Assad uh, less compliant uh, regional uh, uh, structure, I think is really not the case at all. Um, Israel is, is, uh, is, to the extent that there's worry about the Syrians, it's not at all based on, on, on worry of, of, of opposition towards the Syrian government as, as it's presently configured. And as far as I'm concerned, or as far as I know, the only people in Israel who have been uh, supportive or sympathetic to whatever aspirations the Syrian public uh, uh, expresses in its protest movement are people on the, on the far far left uh, because the idea of the Syrian government changing, becoming more Islamist, uh, more representative, uh, more um, reflective of the, of the aspirations and sentiments of the Syrian population is not a, good, not a, a comforting prospect for, uh, for the Israeli political establishment at all. The Syrian government has, has tried with great uh, determination and dexterity to uh, fragment the society and to uh, uh, take advantage of, to, um, to exploit sectarian differences and class differences as well, but particularly sectarian differences within the society to prevent the emergence of a secular uh, non-sectarian, uh, nationalist, opposition, non-violent, this was also very threatening, opposition to the, to the state as presently configured. Uh, the, the kind of psychological uh, anxiety that this sort of, these sort of developments uh, provoke in, in the ruling structures of these various countries, I think this is very real. Uh, and, and, and it leads to a sort of a, you know, whatever's necessary, it's necessary, and they will do it in order to maintain. Uh, and of course, the, the, the demonstration, the, the, the Syrians are in the position, uh, like Iran, uh, of, of, uh, and Putin for that matter, of hanging on uh, in the face, the waxing and waning uh, of, these, of, these, uh, of these movements. And the, the other states that have fallen, I mean, uh, Bashar al-Assad was personally acquainted from his early childhood with, uh, with uh, uh, Muammar Gaddafi and his children. And so the prospect of those people being, being killed and, and paraded uh, naked uh, through the streets as corpses, uh, this is really probably tr more traumatic for them than we can appreciate. Uh, and the notion of, of Hosni Mubarak, uh, who was in power for uh, more than 30 years, uh, being in prison and in jail, uh, you know, this is really, this is, this is, I think that this has really caused uh, a determination for these people not to compromise on any level. Um, and so I think that this is, uh, this is part of the, and they have hung on longer. And, and it's also the case that the, 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 the strategy, the tactic of, of state survival uh, of people like Bashar al-Assad is based on the idea that you outlast your rivals. You, if, they're, if they're weaker, you crush them. And if they're stronger, you just, you just play out the line until you've, you've weathered the, the storm. And that's, that's, that's the, the strategy. Everything else can be re rebuilt later. The structures of the state can be torn asunder and put back together, but you have to survive. And whatever you do to survive, the crisis is, is, is its own justification. So the less involvement there is, the sooner the Syrians will, will have to figure out what the future of their country will look like and the better this is for them and for everyone else. Now, it won't please those foreign powers, but it's not their country. It's the Syrians' country. And they, 
have to be the ones who, who decide what the future looks like. Uh, and there are plenty of, of, uh, of, of decent, uh, uh, smart, well-intentioned people. I think that the, 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 the Syrian National Congress and the various external opposition groups um, have been, have had a lot of factional fighting. And this is, of course, partly because they, they don't really have a role. Uh, and they're not there. And uh, consequently, they're fighting over things that are probably not necessarily important. You know, it could be, I mean, I, in the long run, I, I'm, I'm, I find these, I mean, I think that this is an exciting, it's very painful and traumatic, uh, obviously. But it's also an exciting and and it's a it's a time of 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 new and still provisionally hopeful possibilities for a new kind of of arrangement for citizens to assert their rights as citizens in normal countries that they feel that they have a stake in that are their countries and I mean at the beginning not only in Syria but everywhere, in all of these places, we heard people say over and over again, for the first time in my life, I feel like it's my country. Like I'm, and you know, Bashar al-Assad has been telling everyone, it's my country, and you people all are here as, as uh, on sufferance. And this is what people are, this is what people responded to, this is what people were, were protesting against. The notion that there's, that people are, that some, that there's a, an elite that owns the country, that it's their personal estate, and that everybody else is a kind of a slave. So that's that's finished, and that's that's a in the short term, in the long term, that's a good thing. <laughs>